definitely hearable. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, welcome, uh, welcome to this afternoon's panel. And uh, thank you for your kind introduction. So it'll be a pleasure uh, to introduce the panel. So first of all, uh, we have, uh, of course, you already know him by now, Arjen Meyer, uh, President and CEO of Embraer Commercial. I would like to introduce uh, Michael Peters, uh, who is the General Director at uh, the uh, NLR, so the Dutch Aerospace Center. I would like to introduce uh, Patrick uh, Zaman, who's the CEO um, and founder of AVI. He's busy with the implementation of drone technology in our society. And last but not least, uh, Liam McGill, who is the founder um, of Aerodoft. And Aerodoft is a student here, a team here at Doft, uh, developing an aircraft flying on hydrogen. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to welcome yeah. you to Doft. Uh, so um, to the students, uh, please um, do send your questions uh, along. Uh, I'll be moderating, I'll be looking at the questions and, and um, well, asking them to, to our uh, panel members. Um, and if there's specific questions for specific panel members, please indicate that as well. But perhaps to get started and to get this discussion going, which is on the future of sustainable aviation or on advancing aviation, I would like to ask each and every one of you from your um, individual perspectives to give us a little bit of what your opinion is of what the future sustainable air transportation system will look like at different segments, at different applications, um, and what timelines uh, do you envision? So perhaps starting with you. Okay, uh, that's to me. thank you, thank you. Um, well, that's a broad question, but to be uh, rather concise, um, I th well, first of all, we don't have a choice. I think we all agree that after today that, that we need to make uh, a big trend shift to get to uh, cleaner aviation. Um, at Embraer, we strongly believe that there's going to be different segments uh, with different solutions. Um, at Embraer, we are banking a lot on electric hybrid um, on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, we know there's other alternatives that we're closely looking at the moment. Uh, we know that Airbus is focusing on a bigger segment. Um, so we, we keep a very close watch of, of what, what's happening there. We're working closely with the TU Delft. Um, but in the meantime, and I'm, I'm sure I'll happen to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but we have several initiatives, especially driving the uh, hybrid electric angle uh, for Embraer products. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, at NLR, we do a lot of uh, innovations uh, in order to achieve the, uh, the sustainability goal. And not only, of course, sustainability, because everybody's uh, talking about sustainability, which is of prime importance. Eh? Let, let's, let's be clear about that. But it has to uh, be accomplished in conjunction, of course, with safety. Because uh, I think everybody wants to travel in an aircraft which is very sustainable, but if it's not safe, then, then perhaps the, uh, the, the number of passengers will, uh, will decline a little bit. Um, what, 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 what you said is certainly, certainly true. If, if you, uh, and I did a little bit of uh, statistics, if, if you, uh, and that's valid for, for, for Europe, 80% of the flights, uh, uh, a company for, for uh, flights uh, with a shorter range than 1,700, uh, 1700 kilometers. Um, uh, and that means that over in, in those flights, 80% of the flights, 36% of the fuel is, is, is used. And that means with longer flights, uh, basically you need fuel uh, in order to, to, to carry the range, eh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to accomplish that, uh, that range. Well, what, what's, what's mentioned uh, already, um, 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 uh, there are a number of, uh, of alternatives, because basically it's, uh, it's an energy uh, problem. Um, uh, and, and of course, uh, fuel, uh, fossil fuels uh, are of importance, but especially for the longer range aircraft, uh, the bigger range aircraft, sustainable aviation fuel is of, uh, of prime importance. That's on the, uh, between quotes, high end uh, spectrum, uh, the long range uh, aircraft and the smaller uh, aircraft, electrical, uh, electric hybrid, and, 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 uh, and hydrogen is, is of importance. And basically uh, at NLR we are uh, experimenting uh, basically with, with all of those, uh, those uh, alternatives, and that's exactly in line also what, what Europe is doing in, the, in their newest uh, clean aviation uh, program. So just, just a short recap of the activities we're doing. Yeah, so I think it's an interesting question, what does the future of aviation look like? Uh, and it's actually the reason that, uh, that, uh, that we started with AVI, uh, so around five, six years ago, not far from here actually. 
um, we literally took that uh, uh, as, as a starting block. So taking a blank canvas and looking at with all the knowledge that we have accumulated over uh, all these years, um, if we would reinvent aviation from scratch on, what would it look like? And the interesting thing is that three things came out of that, and we actually founded AV um, uh, on these things. First of all, uh, sustainability. And, and sustainability is not just zero emission aircraft, in my perspective. It's also, and we don't talk about it that often, but it is very important, uh, how we produce these aircraft. Because if we use carbon fibers, if we use different materials, batteries, and so on, sustainability is a broader perspective. Second, um, uh, I personally believe that the future lies in, in vertical takeoff and landing combined with fixed wing aviation. Um, the huge problems that we uh, currently see with building airports, uh, the, 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 the lack of space that we have here, especially here in the Netherlands, uh, the huge discussions we have for new airports uh, uh, in Flevoland and so on, uh, require a new way of thinking. And I think that being able to take off vertically um, doesn't well helps you to not have, need that much infrastructure anymore. And if we transition to a horizontal flight, which is way more efficient, we have the great combination. And and third uh, is autonomy. Um, so full uh, and, uh, automated aircraft that, that flies itself and doesn't require piloting anymore. And these three things they might sound as the future of aviation, but it's actually happening already uh, today. So. Um, Maybe not for, for, for passenger flights, maybe not for large cargo flights, uh, but, but we, we do use them for, for long-range flights, for example, here in the Netherlands with the fire brigade, for medical deliveries as well. So the future is closer than, uh, than we might think. Yes, uh, I agree with uh, everything that's been said before. Uh, I can add a few things. Um, for one, I think if I think about the future of sustainability, I think of or sustainable aviation, I think about a combination of multiple technologies that we have discussed today. We've seen sustainable aviation fuels, we've seen hydrogen. There isn't one solution to all these problems, otherwise I think our lives engineers would be pretty boring, to be honest, uh, if we only had this one catch-all. So I think uh, it is a combination of all of these technologies, which companies uh, are around the table and we're working with, uh, with hydrogen ourselves, um, all will feature into this, uh, this long-term vision. And it's very important, I think we haven't stressed it enough, that when we talk about sustainability, we don't just mean CO2 emissions, we mean um, emissions, other non-CO2 emissions, but also the effect it has on society. We want to be sustainable in society, we want to reduce noise in the future, we want to make sure that living around an airport is possible or is uh, at least a, a nicer experience than it currently is. So I think the future of aviation should be in a direction of reducing not just emissions, but also uh, reducing noise and making life a better for uh, the entire population. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for this individual perspective. It's nice to see that there's more, more to sustainability than what we really think and then how the different uh, technologies would help fill in the different uh, segments. So uh, some first questions that we have uh, from the students. Um, so the first question, which is a very reasonable question that I like, is how much uh, would a zero emission economy class ticket um, be uh, estimated as a fraction of a current uh, normal price? So in a way, would we have to pay more uh, for a future sustainable sort of commercial flight? Now you're looking difficult at me. Question. That's I'm a looking difficult at you. question. Yeah. Uh. No, um, uh, that I don't have the answer to that question. Um, what I can say is that where the technology stands today, um, we are actively looking at a turboprop aircraft for the market. Um, and in that debate, of course, we're looking at traditional uh, energy source or moving to something new. Uh, what we saw there is that if we would move to a 5% non-traditional fuel hybrid combination, we would add 15% to the operating cost of the aircraft. So that gives you a sense of where we are today. And that's not uh, because of the energy source, that's because of more systems, more weight, more maintenance. So it, it, it basically adds throughout the cost of the aircraft. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the equation that we need to solve um, collectively. There's a technical solution, but it also needs to be commercially sustainable. And we need to think about how are we going to plug that into an existing economy? Because if airlines can still fly with old technology at lower cost, the new technology won't get a chance. It's not entirely an answer to your question, but I think it, we, we need to see where that number sits, and I think that number will also be limited to, uh, to what the market can handle. Mm -hmm. 
That's an interesting point, and I think uh, you also mentioned it earlier in the day that it has to also be a politically viable um, yeah, solution. And uh, that brings us to a second question, which is um, who should be the driver of sustainability? So which stakeholder? Should it be the aircraft manufacturer who's driving it? Should it be the airline? Is it from the consumer perspective, or should it be the government? So uh, perhaps an large uh, yeah. point on this. <laughs> I, I, I think at the end, and at the end of the day, and, and, and that's currently what you are seeing, the, the society is driving it. So that it would be the consumers, plural, because it's uh, nobody is debating it that 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 climate neutrality, sustainability is of the utmost importance. So so we all are 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 driving uh, this. Uh, and, and as, as a, a consequence, consequence, of course, uh, uh, rules are, are put on by, by, by the government, uh, additional uh, demands, and, and, and the industry, uh, knowledge institutes, etc., will try to make that uh, possible. Uh, and, and on the slightly longer run, I would even say it, it is a competitive edge for the industry when they can build a safe, sustainable aircraft, then it's really a competitive edge if, if there are other companies who cannot. So, so yes, you have to invest. It's uh, it's uh, it's driven by by the society, like I just uh, said, uh, and and together in in, in uh, as you call it in, in in the Netherlands, the golden triangle. Huh? So, so the the cooperation between knowledge institutes, universities, and industry uh, can can make such competitive and uh, and innovative uh, products. Yeah, if I, if I may add to that, I think it's um, I fully agree. It's it's the it's the society that's starting to drive this. It's a bit like world peace, everyone wants world peace, but still we have wars around the world. I think the individuals, we all want uh, a, a cleaner environment, so I think the governments need to help, to your point. Right? And I think if you listen to the numbers that Glenn just mentioned, not only about getting the project on its feet, but really implementing, building aircraft, it, that's a matter of trillions of dollars. And that's not something the individual <coughs> OEMs, that not the engine OEMs, uh, eventually the passengers will need to pay. Mm -hmm. But I think they will need to come help from the governments to kickstart that um, funding to get it off the ground. And they need to do that in a level playing field because we can't, uh, we can't have a situation that the strongest government will have the strongest aviation industry. Okay. Yeah, which raises an interesting question because if, um, if we want to grow towards a more sustainable aviation in the future and we, we do need innovation there, uh, we, we see usually that innovation um, comes usually from smaller companies or from more out-of-the-box uh, um, uh, driven companies. But at the same time, uh, due to the, um, uh, the legislation, the regulation, uh, safety and certification, it takes uh, so much money to, uh, and so much time to develop new concepts that we do see a paradox here. So uh, I think that this is something where, where the government uh, definitely needs to play a role uh, into to making sure that it helps the whole field to be able to innovate uh, as, as quick as we can. Okay, and you mentioned sort of thinking a little bit outside or beyond the, the just the aircraft itself. Can you perhaps discuss a little bit the uh, other um, sort of adjacent infrastructure that might need to be changed? So in airports, uh, for example, or in operations, uh, when it comes to thinking about sort of future sustainable flight. Uh, uh, you're all welcome to pitch in if somebody would like to start. Uh, well, infrastructure, yeah. it, it's, an, it's an energy problem. Eh? Uh, for instance, uh, suppose we would have aircraft flying on hydrogen. Then, of course, you have to do something about the uh, infrastructure on airports eh? because you have to fuel the aircraft with, with hydrogen, all uh, very cool or un under pressure or, or, or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, if you would have uh, an aircraft which would be fully capable of flying on, on electricity, and, and, and just uh, a couple of numbers pop on, on in, in my head, uh, uh, a single aisle aircraft, uh, 737, 8320, that, that kind of aircraft that, uh, that consumes an electrical power of about uh, uh, 32 megawatts on, 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 on startup. Uh, on a cent and, and uh, between 18 and 20 megawatts uh, for, for just crews. Now that means if you have an aircraft flying for two hours, you have vast uh, uh, amounts of electricity uh, to be put in the batteries, and that's, that's a separate problem. But it also means 
uh, at the current turnaround time of, of aircraft, uh, and they turn around in 15 minutes or, or, or something like that, uh, you have to put in that kind of energy in that aircraft. So that, that, that is, is uh, an, an, a discussion on its own, let's put it like that. So certainly, yes. Uh, it, it, it will have an impact, and that's uh, the, the opinion I have that in the shorter run, shorter between quotes, let's say now in 10 years for the larger aircraft, I strongly believe in sustainable aviation fuels right. as, as drop-in fuels, because you don't have to change anything and you just drop it in the, in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Just my I two cents. Yeah, I think for uh, today, with today's technology, you need 40 to 50 times the weight of a 737 or A320. To fly it on batteries, yeah. in in wet battery weight, and then the problem is, your batteries won't burn across uh, along the way. So you also have to land with those batteries. So I think the challenge is just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. perhaps a logistics a little bit more from from the drone side or the vertical takeoff or. Yeah, well, the, well, the interesting thing uh, there is that what we what we currently see is that if you want full automation, um, you do require docking stations as well. So uh, uh, you have a station that, that, that houses the aircraft, uh, so the, the, the electric VTOL aircraft, um, but that does, that's capable of charging as well. As long as we use electricity, um, that's, uh, that is feasible. But at, at some point, when the aircraft uh, grow larger in, 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 in size and weight, um, we require different solutions. Then we can, uh, go into the field of, um, of hydrogen uh, uh, aviation, and this is, of course, more and more your topic. But this is uh, where it gets interesting, because if, uh, if we would see a network uh, um, uh, for the urban air mobility, as Paul Riemens was mentioning earlier, uh, it might be uh, um, that we get towards a point where every city or village has multiple takeoff and landing zones that do require a hydrogen uh, solution. But if we, um, are, are we then going to, well, uh, refill there? Are we going to change uh, uh, solid packs or, or tanks? Uh, there are still a lot of uncertainties there, but it does re definitely require some sort of infrastructure. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with what's been said before, that if you especially look in the near future, um, we need to change things now. We have a, we have a problem, we have a climate uh, emergency, I would say. And sustainable aviation fuels are logical in the short term to, uh, to reduce our emissions. It's, uh, it's very easy, as you've said, or not easy, but it's uh, changing the current infrastructure is a lot simpler than it would be to completely turn everything upside down and change to a hydrogen economy, for example. And there was last year, I believe, a European Commission report, McKinsey report, about hydrogen aviation, and they essentially concluded, which um, I think our own <laughs> uh, small amount of research has, uh, uh, has also shown, is that if you look at uh, where hydrogen, for example, as a potential fuel is most cost-effective, that would be, in the short term at least, if we're looking you know, to the Flight Path 2050 goals, uh, also the EU goals, would be in short, medium-ranged aircraft, because there, we can deal with the turnaround times that would be extended because of the use of hydrogen, uh, and we can also deal with the fact that the aircraft have to go bigger, of course, to fit um, the more um, the hydrogen into that volume, uh, whereas we would not be able to do that for a longer range aircraft. And I think their conclusion um, was that by 2050, if we could have 40% of the fleet uh, powered by hydrogen and the rest powered by sustainable aviation fuels, uh, in that way, we're not eliminating all of the emissions that we could potentially, but we could do that in the future once we look at uh, other aircraft designs, for example, the blend wing body that uh, Airbus has shown, that sort of uh, design, once we reach another limit on how efficient our aircraft can be, we can then reduce the amount of fuel we have to take with us, i.e. making uh, hydrogen more viable for larger scale aircraft as well. And that will also help with, of course, the turnaround times at airports. Good. Uh, so for this, all these, uh, I think, a few different sort of technologies or propulsion methods were, were, were um, already mentioned. But how do the, the different, each of those might have different timelines uh, associated. How do you see these different timelines fit into just getting to all those uh, 2050 goals or 2035 goals? Uh, how, what, what should be prioritized in the near future? What is more for, for the later on? Um, so... Uh, or you sp already spoke a little bit uh, about this, Liam, so perhaps from uh, NLR or Embraer? Um. Um, yeah, I think as I alluded to in my introduction, um, clearly the short-term priority needs to be on 
um, alternate fuels on offsetting policies and just reducing and improving the existing technologies that we have. And I think for any other idea, we have no time to waste. So we, we need to start because if Airbus is saying 2035, that's tomorrow. And if <laughs> say they would be successful in producing an aircraft in 2035, that means that aircraft has to get to a significant um, supply chain model that it can be built, that it can be supported, that, that that ecosystem that we just discussed needs to get in place. We have 25,000 jets flying around the world that needs to be re replaced. So even if this highly audacious goal gets a reality, replacing that fleet by 2050, that chance is zero to none. So I think it's not a matter of which shall we do first. I think it's a matter of going to the left lane on, on the highway and power up as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And whether the future is in drones or in hydrogen or in hybrid electric, um, I think we need to do what we're good at and what which best fits your model. And I see one of the questions, why Embraer is focused on hybrid electric? The simple answer is, for us it makes sense because we build small aircraft and if it would ever make sense in a platform, it's on the smaller segment. So if we can do an EV toll with four seats electric, I think it's a matter of time that we can maybe increase the range in the seats a little bit to do something on a bigger scale. Is that going to be a 100 seat electric airplane? I think maybe. It depends on the speed and the development of technology. So we need to be working on that. But in the meantime, please, let's also work on hydrogen. Yeah. Because if I listen to Glenn, there's also a lot of pitfalls there. So if we fail there, then we have other opportunities. Yeah. Our current leader is no one single bullet. Uh, no? So, so th th that's, that's basically what, what, what you're telling, and I fully agree. Um, we are talking sometimes or often about climate neutrality versus zero emission. That, that's something else. Eh? If you want to have a true zero emission aircraft, then basically, uh, to my point of view, only electric flight is possible because everything you burn <laughs> gives emissions. Uh, also hydrogen, which is burned, gives emissions, uh, uh, being uh, uh, NOx or, or weight of water vapor or whatever. Uh, and and, and uh, even hybrid electric, where you use hydrogen in a fuel cell producing electricity, it also produces water. And yeah. water yeah. becomes water vapor, and water vapor is a greenhouse gas. <laughs> so you have to think about that. And even what I understood, uh, water vapor at, at altitude is a, is a more um, uh, how do you call it, aggressive greenhouse gas than CO2. So, so think what you are doing. Um, and, that's, and that's the reason also in the, in the future uh, Horizon Europe uh, programs, uh, currently uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in design by, by, the, by the Commission, is that, that, that Airbus and all the, uh, and I think uh, Embraer is also part, uh, part of that, are, are looking in, 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 in a number of uh, different demonstrators. So yes, also hydrogen burn, but also fuel cells and, and, and battery technology. And battery technology currently is, is by far not suitable for, for um, uh, pr uh, uh, propulsion of, of large aircraft, but but who knows what's happened? Eh? Thirty years is, is a lot. Uh, my, my son is studying chem chemistry, and they are talking about um, 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 uh, fixed batteries who already have about twenty times more uh, energy density. Still in laboratories, eh? so far far away. Could could uh, take ten years or fifteen years. But it's certainly not uh, not possible. And and let's face it, what is what's 20 years? Eh? Aviation is 110 years old. Eh? No, no, not more. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and thanks for also bringing up the sort of uh, beyond CO2. So there's other things that really uh, do matter, uh, that we are increasingly becoming more aware of from a scientific perspective. And it's also a matter of bringing those in in this in this sort of discussion about sustainability. But there's also another point on sustainability that I want to get Patrick's point on, is how aviation can help in with a bigger sort of sense of sustainable future. And you alluded a little bit in your introductory uh, remarks. Uh, so uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, so you mentioned the, the fire example. Um, yeah, and it's, and, and it's actually even broader than just the production or the design methods. I, I think that... Um, well, well, personally, I also feel, as a founder of a technology company, that when you when you invent uh, and come up with new technology, that that also comes with the responsibility of what that what that does in society, and um, and then you have to look at the, the whole chain and the whole process, and that that starts literally from the uh, the, the point of designing until uh, the end of operation. And although we might see ourselves as manufacturers, 
uh, that, that's not where our responsibility stops. And um, of course, it's not easy. So I will, uh, I will never say that we, we do everything perfect. Uh, it is hard because we do use a certain uh, type of uh, technology that we buy in from suppliers, uh, which is hard to check how, uh, how they have been uh, uh, produced. Uh, but we do carry the responsibility over it, so we have to, to go there. I think that um, th that's a collective responsibility, I think, uh, for, for everyone in the aviation industry, um, because the, the, the challenges that we face are are broader and as you mentioned also it, it also has to do with if we introduce new type of flights um, which could be the urban air mobility which could be uh, um, uh, city to city uh, cargo flights uh, so so very short range um, what does that do with the noise what does that do with uh, so the acoustics and what does it do with the, the visual interference all things that we have to take into uh, the equation I think mm -hmm. and that brings us into uh, uh, a question on on this trade-off between uh, combustion products and byproducts, but also other emissions such as noise emissions uh, around aircraft. So how do around airports? Sorry. So how do we really go about balancing? That's a, a big debate in my research, at least. How do we go about balancing the different sort of environmental effects of, of aviation? Because there's definitely uh, trade-offs between them. Uh, so that is uh, a challenge. But I'd like to uh, hear uh, a little bit your thoughts. Uh, sorry for me. Yeah. No. Um, it, it's good. Well, I think for the combustion that we're using today, I think fortunately the reduction in fuel and the noise reduction go hand in hand. Um, if we look at aircraft at Schiphol today, uh, I mean there are a lot, lot more. I live under one of the approach routes, and um, you know the, the the noise of aircraft is significantly lower than it used to be. If you look at our E2, the noise of an E2 footprint is 60% smaller than an E1, which was launched in 2004. So you see that trend continuing. Um, I think if you look at concept like open rotor, which undoubtedly could offer another big step in fuel burn, then yes, we get this to this debate because they will potentially generate a lot more noise. And we need to have a conversation with each other, which we think is higher on the priority list. Mm -hmm. Looking at a debate today, I think I know what the answer is. Um, but if for, for drones, for example, um, if they start and take off and land in, in cities, I don't know what the noise impact is. So I think that that's definitely a debate that we need to have. I can't yeah. give you the answer. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, uh, it would be nice if you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, also an interesting topic is, is, is what you're going to use it for. Uh, we are doing projects here in the Netherlands for, uh, for medical deliveries. And uh, you do see uh, um, a big difference al al already with the emergency helicopter. So we have the trauma helicopter in the Netherlands. When people hear helicopter noises uh, and they look up, uh, see what's happening, when they see a black ho helicopter, they, they, they get more frustrated and annoyed than when they see this emergency yellow, uh, orange stripe uh, helicopter. And you see the same happening with drones. So uh, it's also a matter of perception um, of what these type of aircraft will be used for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, unless I'm mistaken, we have uh, another couple of minutes left. Please let me know if I'm mistaken, though. Um, in which case, I would like to uh, perhaps ask a little bit of a selfish question, and that is, what can we as a university, so we do a lot of research and we do a lot of education, uh, especially for obviously our students, what can we do, uh, or can we, what can we do better, uh, perhaps, in this uh, to, to help the, the industry in this uh, sort of uh, quite immense, as we know, but very exciting challenge. Now, I'd like to hear each of your thoughts because you each come from a different sort of uh, uh, stakeholder. So perhaps starting from Liam this time. Yeah, well, uh, we're of course very related to the university. Um, we started Aerodelft essentially for this purpose. We looked at what could we as students do to help the industry or do to help uh, transition to a greener aviation. Uh, and we actually originally started with something that wasn't even to do with hydrogen. We started with drilling millions of holes into a wing and tried to use suction to reduce fuel consumption, uh, which is still a project ongoing because it has a bit more issues than we thought it would originally, but okay. Uh, so we went for the more difficult option, which is hydrogen. Um, but we were thinking, what can we as students do? Because it seems, uh, at least uh, when, we, when I first started in first, second year of a bachelor's degree at the university, that not enough emphasis was placed on learning about what is being done in industry to reduce emissions um, of aircraft. You know, um, are we using different fuels, or are we learning in a course about how aircraft have been built up until now? 
And so that's why we endeavored at Aerodelft was to actually do something practically, to actually design an aircraft uh, that, uh, while not being very big, shows at least the ambitions of students and is within a budget, let's say, uh, and uh, safety constraints that students could be able to achieve. Um, so I think, uh, looking also at the Dream Teams uh, and various other student projects that are going on at the university, there is certainly potential for more of this, um, and uh, I think it would be a good thing for more projects to come up and uh, look into either, if, be it more drone projects um, or be it uh, larger scale projects, perhaps looking at um, the emissions of aircraft in total and trying to come up with infrastructure designs, that sort of idea. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for students to develop their own projects and have a look at that uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so we, we, we work together with, the, with Delft uh, a lot as well. And uh, what I love is uh, the practical approach here. And a lot of innovations in the drone industry actually came from universities here in Delft, uh, the ETH in, uh, in, uh, in, in Switzerland as well. So, so it actually, uh, uh, th there's a lot of, of research that started as desk research and that's actually being implemented right now in operations in uh, the, 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 the long range uh, drone and aviation industry. Um, if there would be one thing uh, that, that, that could be better suited, I think it's the, the timelines, because within, uh, for example, our company, the, the whole startup ecosystem, things go insanely fast. Uh, so uh, with the new regulation uh, that, uh, that European-wide came in last December, or, or already in the past eight weeks, so many things have changed from a technology perspective and how we should build things. Um, we see that a lot of research in Delft is based on four years for a PhD, which is usually, uh, doesn't align that well. So uh, to, to work together, um, like maybe nine to, to 12 month um, milestones uh, uh, would be more suitable. Okay, so more agility, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, it's a quite simple answer, I guess. The, 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 the goals, sustainability goals uh, are, are immense uh, from a technical point of view, mm -hmm. that they're by far easy. And not only um, related to the more traditional aerospace uh, uh, activities, uh, but we need to, uh, to blend in uh, technologies from, from other uh, arenas. Uh, so, so my answer would be uh, keep on pumping out very good, uh, good ideas, uh, fail fast, as, uh, as Airbus uh, once uh, told me, uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to select uh, the good ideas in order to make this, this possible and work together in the network like, like we are doing very, very well in the, in, in the Netherlands as a, in a, as a general point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, a lot of the things I hear, I fully agree with. Uh, one thing I would strongly uh, stress is keep the alignment and the collaboration with the business. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, it's not time for academic dreaming. It's a, it's a time of getting results and getting things done. Uh, and I think uh, TU Delft is a, is, a, is a lighting example there. I think uh, there's a good cooperation. Um, and I think we're defining projects. We need to get access to the funding that, that's a, that is available. And let's not please focus on one horse, but let's spread the attention across several horses because one needs to reach the finish. And yep. uh, let's make sure we have a couple of them. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank you everyone for your uh, yeah, for your <coughs> positions and, and, and your uh, this nice uh, discussion.